Well, welcome everybody. So glad you're here today to be a part of our worship. And man, just love singing together the praise of the Lord and just being aware of the presence of the Lord that is with us. And, and I want you to know the presence of God is here. He's with you right now. He's among us. He is with us. He indwells us. We're going to talk about that too in just a moment. But I just want you to, to sense that we are together as a family of faith and we are meeting together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's speaking to us today. Okay, y'all good with that? Hey, welcome everybody online right now. We're glad you guys are joining us together too. And so I'm going to ask a question, which uh, the question to you is going to be, why are you tuning in? But can I just ask you guys, why are y'all here? I mean, why, why are you putting up with all the traffic out there? Why are you putting up with the hassle? Why did you get up this morning? Why are you delaying your lunch? Why are you here? What are you doing? I mean, is this just something that your mom and daddy made you do? For some of you, that's true, right? Your mom, you have no choice. You got a drug problem like I had when I was a kid. I got drugged to church. Some of y'all got drugged to church today, and that's okay, too. You'll get over it. You'll, li- you'll live to tell about it. But why are you here? If, you're, if you had a choice, why are you here? Is it because it's just what you do in the South when you got nothing else to do on Sunday? You go to church, right? Why are you here? Are you here because it's Sunday, and, and, and you wanted to come and check the church box, and you know that's part of my life, too, and so I want to I wanna do that. Whenever we sing that song, all we want is found in you, Jesus. All we want and all we need is found in you. Every victory is in you, Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Is that true between the hours of 11 and 12, 15 on Sunday, or is that true for you every day? All you want, all you need is found in him. I'm asking you semi-rhetorically, I'm not asking you to talk back to me, but I am asking you, would you Answer that question within you. Do you live that way every day, or is this something you just sing during church? Okay. When we when we sing there that one name is higher and one name is greater, to you alone all praise belongs. Do you mean that between eleven and twelve fifteen? But past that, you know, I mean life, right? And I'm not asking to get on to anybody. That's not it. I'm not putting you on the spot. I am saying, can we talk together and reason together about the realities of our life? I don't know if we like to admit it or not, but this is the way I think many of us, myself included at times, we fall into the trap of viewing our life like this. Okay, we have 168 hours in a week, and there are things that we have to do, and so we have to give a lot to work and a lot to family, and there are money issues we've got to figure out, and there's recreation, we want to play a little bit and sleep a little bit, we got friends, and then there's the God piece, right? There, you, want, you have this God part of you, and you want that, if you're, if you're really, really spiritual, the God part kind of grows, right? But that only means that somebody else is getting squeezed out. And, and, and if you're really struggling, then the God part of your life gets squeezed and, and God may get squeezed out. All right? now, now, again, we're not hating on anybody, but I am saying, can we not have a rational faith and can we not have a reality base within us where we're not just talking smack, but let's listen and think about how is my life really going? Okay? Why are you here? Are you just filling a piece of the pie? Okay, second question I want to ask you, which is going to be related to this one ultimately, because God is a part of your life, versus this second question is, if someone were to follow you for the next three years, and their goal was at the end of that three years to be able to write a book about what makes you, you, or let's flip it around. Let's say you had three years to train somebody to be you. Okay, you got three years, and you're going to train them to be you, What would you teach them? What would you show them? What would you model for them? At the end of that three years, what would they come out at, come out of it looking like? Believing, thinking, living, and acting. Okay? I was thinking about that June the 20th, 2014, when I was on my summer break. I was was sitting alone in a little cabin, and I was thinking, Jesus, when people are around Pine Lake for three years, what should they get? Because Jesus was his disciples for three years. And in a three-year period of time, Jesus was able to transfer to them some principles of life that moved away from being God as a part of their life to where something different was happening. And, And so as I looked at the Gospels and began to categorize the things that Jesus taught and lived and left behind... I I, I shrunk that down into this thing we're calling at Pine Lake, the Jesus-centered life. 
That, that Jesus is a part of your life. Jesus is the center of your life. And he wants you to receive some things, know some things, live in a certain way that reflects Jesus in the culture that you're living in right now. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm, we're talking about this for a couple of reasons. Um, partly because some of you may not know much about our church family. And so we're introducing in this foundation series, we're trying to say to you, hey, listen, this is the church that you're a part of, that you're checking out maybe or are coming to. And so I want you to feel confident about, hey, this is, the, this is what these people believe. Okay, For others of you, you've heard everything I'm about to say today, but it's going to be a refresher for you to remind you that, yep, that, that's what we're about. And I want to be a part of that. Okay, when I die, somebody at my funeral is going to draw three circles. Okay, somebody's going to. So we're going to draw a lot of circles today. I'm actually going to have them on the screen so that they're legible for you. But I want us today to learn to live the Jesus centered life so that we're not just coming to church, we are becoming like Christ. Okay, that's the deal. All right, four principles that Jesus transferred to his disciples and thus to us. Okay, here's the first one. The first principle is your salvation is in Jesus. This is one of the things that Jesus wanted his disciples fundamentally to know is that salvation was in him. John 14, 6, the scripture says this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. You don't get to heaven. You don't get to God except through Christ. Not church, not being better, not keeping the rules. Jesus is the only way. He says in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a payment to get you out of trouble, to redeem you back as a ransom for many. Luke 19, 10 says this, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has, not come, to, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save the lost. Now, you're probably thinking, dude, I ain't really lost. I know what I'm doing. And so you don't really know what you've got to be saved from. And so I want to help you understand what Jesus was talking about in this scripture. Because he's trying to save you from yourself and from the things of this world. Which leads me to the first three circle drawing. We're going to throw the whole thing up on the board and, and show you what it means. I'll kind of walk you through it. This explains what I think the scripture tells us about being saved from, from what and for what, okay? God's design is the way God made you to live. It's the way he designed you to function. We get God's design from the beginning, not from the beginning of your life, but from the beginning in the book of Genesis, where Genesis 1 tells us God's design. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us the design of God before the design is marred uh, in the fall, right? So here's what the Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. You see it? Let them rule. Man is going to rule. He's going to have authority. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over every, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God then created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. He, he made them to rule. He blessed them. And he said to them, here's their charge. Here's their purpose. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over it. This is your purpose. This is your authority. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, when you come to the end of Genesis 2, verse 25, Eve has been created. And this is what the Bible says. And the man and his wife, this is after their, you know, being together, leave and cleave, become one. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now, watch this. Let's go back to the, to the drawing. God's design, God designed us to live in blessing. God designed you to live with peace with him and with other people, not worry, no shame, no fear. He designed you to live in love, love of God, love of, 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 of your neighbor, love who God's made you to be. He made you with purpose. You have a purpose to fulfill, not only in Genesis, but even uh, Jesus says he has purpose for you. And he gave you, he meant for you to live with authority, rule, subdue, Okay. That's the way God designed you to live. Now check this. We walk away from God's design when we sin. And to sin is just to disobey God. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and missed God's perfect mark. And that's not hating. I'm not hazing anybody. I'm not being judgmental toward anybody. I'm just stating a simple fact. I have sinned. I've disobeyed God and you have too. 
You've disobeyed God. And listen, that's not judgmental. It's a fact. And what happens is when we walk away from God's design and do our own thing, it leads to a place of brokenness. And brokenness is putting it very, very gently and mildly. Because here's what I mean by broken. We're saying broken, but here's what the Bible says. You're spiritually dead and cut off from God in your trespasses and your sin. You've chosen to walk that way. The Bible says that you are an enemy of God and a child of wrath, Ephesians 2. It's not pleasant, but it's true that we have moved to the wrong side of God by our own choice. That, that because of that, the Bible says we are now lost. What do you mean we're lost? We have lost everything about God's design. You know, long, when you walk away from God, you move from blessing to now you're under the curse. Genesis 3, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, everything was cursed. You walk away from peace and love and now you have no peace and you're worried and you're ashamed and you have guilt and condemnation and all these things and you're wanting it back. You don't have love so you look for love in all the wrong places. Somebody to make me feel valued and valuable. You no longer have a sense of purpose and so you're hopeless and you don't know if life even makes sense and so some even despair of life and even take their own life because they feel there's no reason to live and we don't have authority. We gave that up. Satan now has our authority. He rules and we are under him and he possesses or oppresses, we are broken. Right, you understand that? And other than that, you're great. You're a mess and you don't even know it apart from Christ. You're living so far beneath the means that God designed you to live because of your own disobedience. Now, here's the deal. God, because of his goodness, does not leave you hopeless. You've tried to fill your life and meet, fill up that broken place, and you could not, so God does. God sent Jesus Christ, God among us, God in the flesh, laying aside the right to use his deity to come be a man. Jesus left heaven, became earth, became a man, became a servant to lay down his life, obedient to the point of death. Because he never sinned and lived by God's design, sin never entered his life so he could be a perfect sacrifice for all people. And through his death on the cross and his burial and then resurrection, Jesus, listen, Jesus conquered, he paid for sin, he conquered death, and he broke the power of Satan, the enemy. Okay, That's what the Bible tells us is now true about you. Now watch this. It's called the gospel of the kingdom because God is transferring you. When you trust him, God's going to transfer you from Satan's dominion to God's dominion. He's going to restore you, recover you, and help you to pursue God's design. Here, please hear me. Please hear me. To receive Christ is not to say, I'm going to go to heaven one day. To receive Christ is to say, I want to live by heaven's design now. I want to live by heaven's design now. I'm not waiting till later. Living by my own design got me to broken mess. What I want is I want to live by God's design, and Christ is the only one who can get me there. So how do I get Christ in my life? How do I go from brokenness to the, to the gospel of the kingdom? The way you do that is by repentance and believing in Jesus. Jesus said, repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is here. So to repent and believe means that you say, I... I finally see it. Oh my goodness, that's me. I am, I am, I am a mess. I'm, I'm, I am dead. And I don't have purpose. And I have looked for love in all the wrong places. And Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Restore me to your design for me. I lay my life down. You fill me up. I believe in you. I believe what you've done. I don't understand it all, but what I do understand, I trust you completely. Listen, when you repent, you're believing, and when you're believing, you're repenting, they go together. You can't say, I believe, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live my own life. Doesn't work that way. Okay? Doesn't work that way. You don't try to do better, but I'm not trusting in Jesus. No, they go together. Your salvation, God, God is giving you right now. He wants to move you to blessing, to love, to peace, to purpose, and to authority right now. Your salvation is in Jesus. Everybody say salvation. salvation. That's good. That's strong. Stay with it. Salvation. Your rescue from yourself and your sin and restoration to God's design. Save from me, from sin, from death, from Satan. Return to, save for God's design. That's in Christ. Okay. That's principle number one. Here's principle number two, and that is that your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Jesus. 
John 15, 15, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and this is what he said to them. He said, no longer do I call you slaves. That was their title. No longer do I call you slaves or servants. For the slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that the that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Now, I wanted you to see that Jesus changed their identity. You're not slaves, you're friends. And that was just one of the ways in which Jesus changed the identity of his disciples. It's what he wanted them to understand, is that he came to make them something other than what they were on their own. He could say to the, the first disciples, listen, you've been fishermen, but I'm about to make you a fisher of men, right? A change of identity. He could say to Cephas, who was a a mixed up mess and very unstable, your name is Cephas right now, but you're going to be Simon. You're going to be Peter, a rock. I'm speaking that over you. Your identity is about to change. He could say to a demon-possessed man, you have been demon-possessed, but I'm giving you back your sanity, your mind, your your, your right mind, clothed, and I'm sending, you've been a demon-possessed man, and that's what everybody said about you, but I'm sending you back home, a husband and a daddy. Okay, Change the man's identity by his touch. He could take a woman caught in adultery and say, you are no longer going to be known as an adulteress. Rise and, and go. Your faith has saved you. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, go, don't go do that anymore. Jesus would speak things about people's lives, and then they'd have to grow up into, accept it, grow up into it, and live it out. Same thing is true for you and for me. God has spoken some things about you and about your identity that he wants you to receive and then grow up into and live out. The Bible uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 reads like this. This is Paul writing. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Okay, now this is what I want you to see. God wants to sanctify you entirely, completely, every bit of you. Okay, so here's every bit of you. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame until at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, do you see? Your entirety is you are a spirit, soul, and a body. Do you see that? Okay. Now, now some people get caught up on that. We'll, We'll talk about it a little bit, but the Bible says you have spirit, soul, and body. Now, let's draw three more circles because this is who you are, all right? The Bible says all of us have a body, okay? And in your body, your physical body, which is your dwelling, right? Your earthly dwelling, it's where you're conscious of the world. You have five senses that you can see and hear and touch and taste and and experience the world, right? Every one of us have it. Now, listen, your dwelling, your body is temporary. The Bible calls it a tent, Okay, so it's not forever. Some of you are saying, thank God for that, right? But it's not forever, but it is a dwelling temporarily, okay, where you're conscious of the world. But inside of your body, what gives life to us is called our soul. That's where we're self-conscious, and your soul is your personality. It's made up of, it's who you are. It's made up of your intellect, the way you think, your emotions, what you want, and your will, how you choose to live life, okay? Listen, you have a soul. It's an eternal part of you. There, there is an eternal part. Your body is temporary. Your soul is forever. Animals have souls. All dogs go to heaven. Cats, not so much. But, <laughs> but the thing that, listen, the thing that distinguishes you from every other creation is this. You alone are made in the image of God. Father, Son, Spirit. You have body, soul, spirit. And your spiritual center is the place where you are God conscious. It's the place of faith. It's the place of worship. It's the place of prayer. It's where you commune with God. Now watch this. When you sinned and you walked away from God, that part of you died. Whenever you believed the gospel of what Jesus was doing, he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of you and he made you alive again. Now, this is who you are, restored to the identity that God created you to have. Watch this. Many of us live from the outside in, and it's very frustrating. We're trying to get our identity in what we do and what people say about us, and it's very frustrating. You're trying to live outside in under your own strength to fill up something on the inside, and it never works. Okay? It's this, it's this treadmill, this cycle where you just want to forget about it altogether. God's calling on you and me today in our identity to start living not from the outside in, but from the inside out. That you would accept 
who Jesus says you are and then let who he says you are begin to change what you think, how you feel, and even what you choose to do. Okay? He wants you to stand in your identity. Jesus says you are chosen and holy and dearly loved and righteous and perfect, a child of God forever. You're not your sins and your struggles or your shortcomings. You don't have to strive to please God. You have Christ in you. You're new. You're alive. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're royal. You're a priest. You're chosen. You are God's possession. Now, we could list all kinds of things that the Bible says you are, but two primary things I want you to put on lockdown in your mind. You are a child of God. Okay? You're a child of God. This is what Jesus wanted his disciples to know. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. He's not trying to make you a better churchgoer. He's trying to make you a son or a daughter. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God, and that's exactly what we are. And the world doesn't recognize us because it didn't recognize him. But you are a child of God. Romans 8, 15 says, For we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That, that Go back to the three circles. That, that, that at the spiritual level, the Spirit of God now says, you are my child. Secondly, the Bible tells us that you are a saint. Now, if I were to ask you, how would you describe your spiritual life? Some of you might say, well, I'm a Christian. Some of you might say, if you're really, really serious, you might say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. Okay? The word Christian occurs two times in the whole Bible. The word disciple occurs 27 times uh, in the New Testament, 25 of which are in the Gospels themselves talking about the 12 or the 70 that were following Jesus. Only five times does it talk about other believers. But the word saint is used to describe Christians 60 different times in the New Testament. You don't see yourself that way, but here's what I want you to hear, that because the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, you are a saint. Because His Spirit is in you, that's who you are. And this identity ought to transform you. Christy and I had the uh, joy on Friday night to go to a... um, an awards uh, gathering for Phi Beta Sigma fraternity from Jackson State. And uh, they had their sister sorority, Zeta Phi Beta, there. And so they were giving these awards. And through the night, uh, different people would say, I want all, the, uh, I want all the, the brothers to stand up, all the Sigmas to stand up. And all these guys would stand up. Now, not every man in the room stood up, but only those who were in that fraternity. But they, they stood up. Didn't matter what their job was. Didn't matter what their title was. Didn't matter how young or old they were. Every man who said, I'm a Sigma, stood up. All right? There were moments whenever they would say, hey, I, a lady would say, hey, I want all the Zeta Phi Betas to stand up. And all the ladies wearing blue dresses would stand up. Now, not every woman in the room stood up because not every woman in the room was a Zeta. But those who were stood up. Didn't matter what their job was. Didn't matter how young or old they were. They identified as, I'm a Zeta. All right, now, track this. You may not, you may not, there, there was something about them that identified, this now defines me. I've received that identity. You may not get the Greek system, so let's think about it this way. Some of you just started med school this week, and you got your white coat, which means now that when you walk around the hospital, your head's probably four times bigger than it ought to be, right? (laughs) Because that means you are a doctor in training, and when you start getting initials and letters behind that that name on that coat, it may even get worse. What, what, What does it mean? You put that on, and all of a sudden, I have taken on an identity. I am a fill in the blank, okay? Now watch this. God has said that you are his child and you are a saint and that ought to affect the way you live. Listen, some of you are bound up in shame. You have received labels from the outside in and you've received labels that you're a failure or you're you're a loser or you're an adulterer or you're an addict and that's all you'll ever be. That's outside in. You need to start saying, no, 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 no. God has made me his child. I'm a saint. Okay, put that on. Put that on. If you receive this identity, it'll change your relationship. Most of us try to do relationship from the outside in. I'm needy, I'm needy, so somebody fill me up. Make me feel good. And so we come at each other needing stuff. You're a taker. No, 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 no. Watch this. If you say, 
Jesus lives in me. I have all the love and all the peace and all the joy I'm ever going to need in you, God. Fill me up. All of a sudden, I don't need you. I can now be a giver to you. I'm not a taker. Do you understand how that would change a lot of nagging that goes on in relationships? Do you understand how that would change a lot of taking and selfish behavior if you lived inside out? It would change your focus of, of your real identity. I was at the gym the other day, and a guy who goes to church with us was watching me work out, and he walked up to me, and he was laughing. He said, dude, there are women in this gym who curl more weight than you do. And it's true. There are some women in there who... And I told him, I said, look, they can whip my behind. I know it, dude. That's just, but I'm over 50, all right? I'm past that now. I'm not worried about that anymore. I ain't worried about the dwelling. The dwelling gonna go down, right? I'm just, I'm delaying things. What I really want to do is, man, my pride is gone on that side. What I really want to do is learn to grow on the inside now. Strengthen the inner man. I want to sometimes say to those guys, all swole up walking around the gym. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, swole up like this. I want to say, man, get some Benadryl and get that swelling down. <laughs> right? Y'all know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one with the 120-pound dumbbells, and they're doing incline flies, and whenever they drop it, man, it's bang, it bounces around, and, and they get up, and everybody's looking because the man with the muscle just dropped it. I'm not hating on those guys, but I do want to say to them sometimes, hey, dude, you're really strong on the outside, but in, in here, do you have anything? Because a lot of times what we're doing out here is to compensate for the nothing in there. And if you got a choice of being strong in here or being strong out here, what time will show you is being strong in here is way better. Jesus today, if you read the L3 in Luke 12, uh, Luke 12 says this. He says about a rich man who had so much that he couldn't have, he didn't have enough barns to hold his stuff. And so he says, man, I'm about to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And Jesus said, you idiot, tonight your soul, the eternal part of you is required of you. Who's going to get it all? And then he says, it's the same way with you who are rich in the world but are not rich toward God. So can I just ask you, who don't have to go to the gym because you've got your own gym at home. Okay? I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying, if you can afford anything you want to, are you rich in the world? And there's nothing wrong with that if God's blessed you that way. But it is wrong if you're not rich toward God. Is that, you, you tracking with that? This is my identity. Everybody say identity. 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 Who are you? Okay. Third principle is your life is in Jesus. Your life, the way you live your life. Jesus lived his life following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.1. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Jesus is full of the Spirit. He is being led by the Spirit. Jesus is not operating as God. He's laid that aside to come to earth. He is watching the Father. He is filled by the Spirit. John 5, 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus did what the Father did. John 5, 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative, Jesus said. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was led in his life daily by the presence of God. And you, as his follower, are called to live your life daily following the leadership of the Spirit of God within you. Okay, I'm not talking about a piece of your life. I'm talking about all of your life, God, lead me. Now, there's a scripture you can go look at later on, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through chapter 3, verse 3, where Paul describes three different kinds of people, three more circles with chairs in them this time, okay? This is about life. The circle represents a person's life. The chair represents the throne or control of the life. Self is on the throne calling the shots, and Christ is outside that person's life. The Bible calls that a natural man. You don't understand spiritual things. People tell you spiritual stuff, and it just goes right over your head. You do not understand it. You read the Bible, and you're like, man, I don't have any idea what that says. You can't understand it because you don't have Christ in your life. You're not living by God's design yet. You're still broken. That's the natural man. Then there's another kind of person over here, and this is the spiritual man. The spiritual man has the mind of Christ. 
understand spiritual things. Christ is not only in, their, in your life, but on the throne of your life, and you are surrendered, that's the key word, surrendered to his leadership in your life, just like Jesus was to the Father and the, and the Spirit. You see that? That's called a spiritual man, and those are the only two kind of people there are, those who don't have Christ and those who do have Christ. Okay? Practically, however, in our experience of living out our lives as Christ followers, we find ourselves in a battle. And so Paul says there's this third kind of man. He calls it a fleshly or an immature, some people may say carnal, person. Christ is in your life, but, but you're still calling the shots. All right? There, there's this battle between this chair and this chair where you, Romans 7, I'm doing stuff I don't want to do. I'm not doing the stuff I want to do. What's wrong with me? Self still in control, okay? That's why you go to Romans 8, and Paul says, thanks be to God, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, because what I couldn't do in my flesh, the Spirit of God did for me. And so Paul would go on to say in Romans 8, 14, he says, listen, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the true sons of God. I wanna, can, I, can I just say, this is a reality of our battle, but can I just say to you, if you find yourself spending the majority of your life, if not all of your life in this circle, and God's not leading you, can I, can I ask you to do what Paul says in the scripture? Would you examine yourselves to make sure you're, you're in the faith? Because what you're calling a self-directed life, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm kind of doing my own thing. What, what Paul would say is it's very, very likely that maybe you don't have Christ in your life at all. You're really right here. And you've believed, but you have not repented. Remember, both of them go together. You tracking? So, so here, here's what Jesus did. He lived here, and he calls on you and me to live right here too. Think about how this would transform work for you if you started saying, God, I want you to be the one who tells me how to do my job. And God says, okay, be honest. Oh, Lord, that's not the way it works. For who? Life. Because you, you can run it. Or you can let him run it. God, I just want you to direct my schoolwork. Okay, you're going to have to study and apply yourself. But Lord, it'd be easier to cheat. Everybody else is. You ain't everybody else. When it comes to your vocation, are you living here and saying, God, would you just show me what to do? Or are you saying, this is what I want my child to be. This is what you're going to go do. God, would you bless them to do it? Come on, this is where it gets real, right? When it comes to what Jesus taught about living our lives to forgive somebody, would you really forgive them? I don't want to forgive them. Then you're going to move here. But if you say, God, I do not want to forgive them. This kills me to forgive them. But I'm going to surrender to you. You're going to have to help me to do this. God says, I can bless that. I can bless that. When it comes to purity, God, it's a good idea but I don't really want to do that. You can move back under that curse if you want to. But God says, if you'll surrender your life to me, I can bless that. You tracking? Okay. Whenever it comes to impulses, if God says, I want you to speak a word, would you speak it? If God says to you, look, I know your husband's had a really, really, really bad day and he's dumping on you, but don't, don't go here and retaliate I want you to love him anyway. You understand how that could change things? If the Spirit of God said, hey, listen, there's a, there's a day of service at your church today. And you said, yes, God, but it is hunting season. <laughs> that's my battle right there, okay? I'm just telling y'all. That's Will I say, your will be done or my will be done? Do y'all understand that? Your life is to be lived in Christ. Blessing, love, peace, purpose, and authority are experienced as you live in that third chair. Everybody say life. 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 Your life is in Jesus. Okay? Last one quickly is your authority is in Jesus. Your authority is in Jesus. This is one that's hard for us to get our minds around and even to comprehend, but, but, we, but this is what Jesus taught. It's what he lived. It's what he left. Okay? Jesus clearly lived with authority over devils, demons, disease, and nature. Do you all agree with that? 
Y'all agree with that? I mean, come on, say yes if you do. Do y'all agree with that? Jesus did. I mean, Jesus would, would heal people, cast out demons, even though they were rebelling against him. Jesus could steal storms. And how, how was he doing that? He was doing it by, God, what do you want to do? And whatever God told him to do, he'd do it. And the power of the Spirit made it happen. But Jesus had authority because he never sinned and walked outside of God's design. God designed us to live with authority. He never gave his up. You and I did. Satan took ours. So Jesus came to take it back. Jesus came to give back to you what you lost in sin and disobedience. Isn't that awesome? He had all authority. The scripture says, Jesus said, I've got all authority. The Bible says in Ephesians that he has given all authority. God's put him in control of everything and given him as head over the church. Our leader has all authority. We would agree with that. You'd say, but I ain't Jesus. No, you're not. But you're in Jesus. Well, no, no, no. Christ is in me. I received Christ into my life. Yes, you did. But you've got to understand the fullness of the transaction of the gospel of the kingdom that yes, indeed, you received Christ into your life, but he restored you to God's design. You're in him, but now he's in you. Don't take my word for it. Take Jesus' word for it. John 14, 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. John 17, 21, Jesus prayed this right before he was betrayed, that they may all be one, Father, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is a verse that you've read before, but you haven't thought about it this way. If anyone is in Christ, not Christ in you, if you're in Christ, you're a brand new creature. Do you see it? Colossians 3, 3 says this. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ where? Say it. In God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. What I want you to hear is that the word of God tells you, yes, Christ is in you, Christian, but you have been placed, spiritually speaking, into him. And furthermore, he wants to give you The authority that comes with being in him. Check out the circles, all right? These are our circles, all right? This is God's organizational chart. God and the devil aren't side by side fighting over you. They're equal in power fighting over you. That's not what the Bible says. And and, and though there was a time when God was over the devil and you were under that, whenever God restored you, when you believed, he put you right on up here to God's design. He put you back into Christ. This is God's org chart. You are now hidden with Christ in God. And if God is over the devil and you're in Christ, where are you? Just look at it. Now, practically, I know you don't feel this, but I'm saying this is true. And Jesus, who has authority, actually gives authority to his disciples. We don't have time to go back and look at Luke 9, where he gave the 12 authority to go proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and throw out demons and heal disease. The next chapter, Luke 10, he gave 70 people that same authority, proclaim the gospel, throw out demons, heal diseases as an evidence that God's design is here. The power of the enemy is broken. Okay? Well, that was them, Chip. That's not me. Yeah, but John 14, 12 says this, or 12, 14 says this, or 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, that's you and me, The works I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. God promised that when you believe in him, the authority that he has, God says, I'll give it to you and let you begin to exercise that on earth. You're like, Chip, I don't think I can get with that, dude. I know, look, I'm I'm with you. This is a growth point for me too. If you ask me where in the Jesus-centered life God's growing me most, it's all over, but right here certainly is a point. We don't understand it. I just don't feel it. I just don't know if that's true. I don't feel that. That's just not true of my experience, okay? Let's suppose that tomorrow you got a call from an attorney who said you have a long-lost relative who is filthy rich that you barely, that you didn't even know, but this relative who has passed left you $100 million and a 72-foot yacht. Would you say, you know, I just don't feel, that just doesn't feel right to me. (laughs) <laughs> I got a feeling you get to feeling better about it, right? <laughs> you know, I've just never had that experience. It just doesn't ring true to me. You know, I tried to drive a boat one time, and, and I wrecked it out on the reservoir, and it was just a jet ski. A 72-foot yacht seems a little much. No, no, no. I got a feeling we could learn to drive or hire somebody who would. 
Come on. What I'm saying to you is if you got that call that all of a sudden you had something, what you would not do is say, it's just not true of my experience. I've never felt that way because I've never done it. It can't be true. No, no, no. You would get used to what is true and make what is true begin to impact what you feel and what you experience. Can you track with that? Because here's what happens. We're all good with God until God starts saying to you, I want you to start standing in my design to subdue and rule spiritually in this earth to begin to bring the kingdom of God that is now inside of you. It's been over you. It's inside of you. And now in your family and in the places that you live, I want you to be, you to be an agent of bringing the kingdom, exercising spiritual authority and making disciples and in praying and in binding and loosing things and, and, in, and in seeing God do Helping you stand against the enemy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm, I've just never been able to do that. Come on, we're being real, right? We're just being real, so us talking. But come on, how many of us, that's the way we live? Sometimes better than others. There was a time when you used to stand in that authority and believe that, man, God could defend your house and defend your heart, but now you've been under it for so long, you've started to doubt the truth of God. Look, it's still true, whether you feel it or not. And so what I'm saying is, let God grow us into, would you let God grow you into the reality that God doesn't want to be a little piece of your life and then you live on your own. God is saying, I want to be the center of your life and I want to help you to live by my design for you, a place of blessing, a place of love, a place of joy, a place of purposefulness, and a place of authority where you don't have to succumb to the enemy who's had his authority snatched away. And God says, now live the life I want you to live. So what are you doing here? What are you doing here today? Is it just Sunday and I'm going to church? Am I checking that box and I got that piece of my pie? I don't have to come back for two more weeks now. Or is God showing you that he wants to be everything? All I want and all I need is found in Christ. And that's not just from 11 to 12, 15 on Sunday. It's every single day. That There's a name that is higher and greater and that can bring you victory and power and strength. Every single day, not just from 11 to 12, 15, but every single day. Do you hear God calling you to something more? Here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like for us, Pine Lake, when you put it all together. Your salvation, your identity, your life, and your authority are all in Jesus. And we call that here the Jesus-centered life. That's the family we're inviting you into. We want you to know that you belong. And it doesn't matter what your past has been. God's grace is greater. His love is enough. But he has a design for us, and we want to walk in the fullness of it. Can I just say this? Our state does not need more churches. And by that, I mean more buildings filled with people checking the church box. What we need is more Jesus-centered life givers. Can y'all agree with that? More Jesus-centered life givers. And I'm, I'm talking to the people sitting in the very top row up there. You, you are loved by God and he has a design for you. And he wants to fill you up and he wants to use your life to bring blessing and grace and love to so many people. I want to talk to somebody who right now is sitting at home alone and you felt unworthy to come to church. Can I just tell you in the name of Jesus, by his power and authority, you are loved. In the lie of the enemy, you must be silent. Christ has made you new. Stand in that. Can I say to us, God's calling us in. Would you pray with me? Could we just pray to that end and just say, God, thank you. God, thank you. Bless you. Thank you that your word, God, has captured your truth. And Lord, that you have shown us who you are and what life's to be like. And God, you're calling us in. And so can I just lead you to pray? Would you pray right now about just that whole idea of salvation and God's design? Are you walking in God's design? Blessing, peace, and love. 
sense of purposefulness and authority? And if not, would you just admit it and say, God, I'm a broken mess. But I am repenting and I'm turning to you, Jesus, the giver of life. You're my only hope and you're my only hope and you're not a song. You're my Savior. Restore me to God's purpose and I want to live there for the rest of my life. I surrender to you. Would you do that maybe for the first time or maybe you're doing it again right now? You living from the inside out or from the outside in? What's your identity? Could you just right now say, God, forgive me for trying to fill the emptiness in me with the stuff of the world? And would you just own that and say, God, it's just never going to work. I'm just never going to. I don't want to be defined by titles and accomplishments and achievements. And it, God, it never satisfies the deepest longings of my heart. So would you just say to God right now, God, would you fill me up? Holy Spirit, would you fill me with the truth of your presence? You say, God, get rid of everything about me. Fill me with your presence. Would you say right now, just under your breath, would you say, I am a child of God? And would you say, I am a saint by calling. God, your spirit lives in me. Have your way. I am who you say. Lord, I pray that that would begin to transform our focus and our relationships and God, everything about us. When it comes to life, which circle are you living in? Natural man, spiritual man, or fleshly? God's there, but he's not in charge. Would you just, would you correct that? Would you just let the Spirit of the Lord work with you in that right now? Would you surrender to him and say, God, lead me. Holy Spirit, lead me. I surrender my mouth. I surrender my mind. I surrender my eyes. I surrender my heart. I surrender my hands, my checkbook, possessions, career. Lord, it is in your hands. Lead me. Lead me. And God, I pray that you would lead. And God, begin to bring new life. And Lord, as we are surrendered, God, the blessing and favor and grace would come. Lord, would you meet us? When it comes to authority, this may be new, may not be familiar, but it's still true. Would you just say to God, Lord, I never really realized it, but I am in you. You're in me, and I've been placed into you. And Lord, because of that, I don't have to do what the devil says. God, you've given me strength, and I receive that. Lord, I want to bring the kingdom. I want to stand in your authority, and I want to learn how to pray. And God, I want to learn how to talk to my friends about this whole thing of learning to live in your design and your kingdom. God, help me. But I want to stand in it. I don't want to have an excuse. I just want to stand in it and live in your authority. Father, would you meet us? In just a second, we're going to sing one last song here of response where we say, Christ, you are our cornerstone. You're enough. You're the center of everything we do. And listen, while we're singing this song of response, there are going to be some ministers around the room. They'd love to pray with you if you want to give your life to Christ or have them pray with you in authority for what God's stirring in your heart. Would you, when we stand, would you come and let us pray with you? Father, we love you. Have your way now. In Jesus' name, amen. 